Hello, this is a rubric making tutorial video for SMU TESOL students, um, particularly uh, students who are in the process of writing their final written lesson plans, which requires a rubric for a fluency assessment. Um, now, to be clear, this will all be taught to SMU students in the last week of class, which is to say the first day of methodology in the last week of class, which is either the last Tuesday of class or the last Wednesday of class. So even if you don't watch this video, you are going to get these skills um, early enough to apply them in a simple rubric for your final written lesson plans. Uh, by the due date. Uh, so uh, what you're looking at now is the rubric handout, which I made for SMU students uh, to show you how to make a rubric, a simple rubric for uh, performance assessment um, because rubrics are used on performance assessments. Performance assessments are uh, measured and just in specific ways, looking for particular criteria, and these rubrics help us to uh, maintain our reliability uh, as we assess those uh, performances of students. So uh, if you look at the top of this handout, you can see that uh, the very first step in this uh, rubric making process is about identifying your fluency focused activity that you're going to focus on. So in the case of a final written lesson plans rubric, you're looking for whatever fluency assessment that you're using, whatever fluency activity that's in there on one of your days of uh, lessons. And so once you pick that out, the next thing that you want to do is quite simply to identify the objective of your activity. Now, this is why we've been talking about the importance of objectives throughout the semester, uh, because your objective is going to help you uh, to identify criteria for that assessment. So criteria for the rubric. So for example, uh, our sample activity is a speed dating activity, speed dating. Now, speed dating, when we talk about speed dating, um, what we mean is the kind of activity where you have men and women or boys and girls or sometimes all the same gender depending on your class and what each student has to do is to kind of quickly interview the, the people that they are dating to find a match. Uh, so usually the way this activity is done is you have a long table and on one side of the table some people are sitting and they have their information about their character, who they are, who they are whatever it is, their age, their interests, what they're looking for. And then on the other side of the table, uh, people, the people sitting there are asking them questions and trying to find a match. And then after a certain amount of time, they have to stand up and move to the next person uh, down and so on until they find their match. It's a great classic fluency activity. So in this speed dating activity, the, the objective is Students will be able to ask and answer questions about personal information and future plans uh, with multiple partners. So not the best objective, but it works for this. I mean, you might actually have something in there with a number it would probably be more helpful, like uh, for three minutes or uh, ask uh, three questions, whatever it is. So once you have your objective, then you have your, you can create a grid with different, different 
uh, performance level indicators. Now, if you're doing the final written lesson plan, this has already been done for you, and it's done with check marks as um, the levels of performance. So you have check minus is lower than uh, lower than adequate. Check is about adequate. It's a, it's you know okay. Check plus is above that adequate level. Uh, you can use different things if you want. Um, I find that if you use symbols, it's a little bit less uh, negative than than using words that are associated with poor performance, like developing or um, novice or whatever. Okay, so you have your grid. The next step is you want to choose criteria which are based on that objective. So there are different ways you can do this, but remember it's always based on your objective. I've listed here possible criteria that you can use in your rubric. Um, now it's a fluency activity, so that's going to kind of limit what you're looking for. But uh, some possible criteria, and as I mentioned here, there are many others, uh, you could include development. Again, it's appropriate for some activities, but not for others. So it's kind of a case by case thing, but development is certainly a criterion that's used often with uh, fluency speaking and particularly fluency writing. It just means that you're saying enough, that you're developing your ideas and you're not uh, too short or simple in it. So, you, so development is one option. Um, Another option that's kind of an easy one is, is task completion. So let's say, for example, the assignment was, or rather the activity was, to uh, you know, agree on a, it, like a role play where you have to agree on a solution for a problem and you have to uh, then present that problem to another group. Well, task completion would mean Yes, they, they negotiated in their group. Yes, they agreed on that thing as they're supposed to. And yes, they also uh, presented it to another group, which was in, their, uh, in that activity. So task completion means they've actually completed it and all the parts associated with it. Development is usually about the length, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, content knowledge. This one uh, is appropriate when students are demonstrating not only knowledge of language or uh, the ability to use language, but we're also, they're also demonstrating, uh, you know, that they know something about the topic or they know something about the content area that's been covered. So, for example, if your fluency activity is about uh, giving a weather forecast or something. That content knowledge could play a part uh, because they have to demonstrate that by the way they talk about the weather, you know, they, the way that uh, th uh, possible weather types, right? And so, you know, they, they demonstrate a little bit about the content of the meteorology or the weather somewhere in there that might be appropriate for that. Again, not necessarily just the words, but knowing something about the idea. Another one that I've given you here, um, these are actually three. Now, uh, sometimes it's appropriate to separate them. Sometimes you could lump them all together as accuracy. And in the case of a fluency activity, it just does not make a lot of sense to separate them because then you have three different accuracy-based criteria, and they should certainly not be uh, the only things or the majority of the, of the criteria that you're looking at in a fluency activity. So what I might do is I might lump pronunciation and vocabulary and grammar together as uh, accuracy, and then uh, in each of the performance levels and the descriptors, what I might say is, you know, adequate or, or, uh, or pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar uh, errors are absent or they do not affect communication, something like that. 
uh, it could be the high level. And the lowest level would be, you know, frequent errors of pronunciation, vocabulary, and or grammar, uh, which hinder communication, something like that. And the middle area is something in between. So that's a possibility for uh, many fluency tasks. Um, and the other things you want to look for is any task-specific criteria that, you know, uh, maybe just for your task would be appropriate. That's where it really depends on what your task is. So, for example, uh, when we had the fluency activity of uh, drawing past, present, and future uh, pictures and introducing yourself with those pictures, uh, well, one of the task-specific criteria for that could be uh, the completeness of the images, for example. So that might be a task-specific criteria, the images part, the pictures that were drawn. Okay. Now, another one that I've included here um, is appropriateness. Now, um, appropriateness, it's not necessarily going to be appropriate for your uh, fluency activity, but um, in the case of uh, something clear like uh, a role play between a CEO and a worker of a company, then appropriateness could be a really significant criterion. Okay, so not only did they complete the task or uh, of, you know, negotiating for a raise or whatever it is um, and demonstrate, you know, and the accuracy wasn't a problem, for example, but also the, their use of language was appropriate and they didn't use, in this case, uh, informal language to request a raise from the CEO. They didn't use, you know, uh, language that's more appropriate for, for uh, written English than uh, spoken English, for example. Those could be examples of appropriateness. Um, and so your different levels would then be, you know, there were no errors of appropriateness, and so it was overall appropriate, right? The, the lowest level would be frequent errors of appropriateness or um, simply the performance in part was inappropriate for its purpose, something like that. And the middle is the tricky one would be something like, in between those two, so mostly appropriate, uh, with one or two errors of appropriateness, something like that. Now, remember, this list is not um, this list is not definitive. It's not complete. It's not the only options, uh, but these are some some of the criteria that you could choose. Now, uh, the next step would be. Uh, to create suitable descriptors for each level, which I've given a few of them already. So how do we distinguish between levels, which tends to be the trickiest part of this assessment. So uh, my tip for that is to start with your highest level. That's how will students demonstrate mastery of that criterion. Um, and then you can do the lowest level and then do the middle one uh, as something between them. Okay, uh, and so I've given you some ideas about the use of absolute language, um, which is an ICC connection, um, but be careful about using words like always and never. I mean, sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's okay. You can say uh, zero mistakes or never makes errors, something like that, but Often it's more useful to, to talk about, uh, you know, consistently speaking with accurate pronunciation, for example. Um, and notice too, this, the first one, always speak with perfect pronunciation. We don't want to see the word perfect anywhere in your rubric. Let me say that again. The word perfect should not be anywhere in your rubric because that's First of all, what does perfect mean? And second of all, that's not a standard that we want to set for our students. It's not an achievable goal, perfection. What is that? As a native speaker, I don't feel like I achieve perfection in my speech. 
Anyway, um, and similarly, they should be observable. This is why we've been talking about observable objectives for uh, the entirety of our course because uh, you want to be able to you want to be able to observe these criteria in the performance. So, for example, not student does not understand how to talk about past events. That's a judgment. That's a judgment that somebody makes based on something they see. So what we want to know is what is that thing that they see that, you know, leads them to say they don't understand. Well, something like fails to demonstrate understanding that's telling me that, okay, they don't, fails to demonstrate past uh, understanding of past narration. That's telling me that they're uh, not using past narration would be another way to say that. Or the student rarely uses past forms of verbs or uh, devices to narrate past events. So it shows how demonstration is observed. So like objectives, they should, they should also be uh, not use absolute language. They should be observable. They should also be specific. So, for example, the student doesn't know many words. A better one would be the student only produces single words and memorized utterances. Okay, so that tells me specifically what the learner does. So just keep those in mind. Um, I've also included some level helpers that are really going to get you started. Now, uh, some of these won't necessarily fit with your criteria. So if you have questions, please run them by your methodology teacher. Uh, but for example, at the high level, uh, check plus level, we could say uh, consistently, usually, often, thoroughly, depending on what the criterion is. Okay, so consistently uses uh, future will. Uh, or usually, which can also be maybe a middle level as well, usually uh, expresses the function of apology. Um, often, uh, <laughs> often chooses appropriate forms of, of the verb or whatever it is. Um, and so a noun for the high level could be mastery. The student demonstrates mastery of da-da-da. A verb could be includes, the student includes, blah, 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 or adjectives like complete and exemplary. Okay, and if we look at the middle level, we have sometimes, student is sometimes doing this, the student demonstrates understanding, which is less than mastery, the student succeeds in, da, da, da. the student includes some, da, da, da. or satisfactory, adequate, those are all the kinds of words that could be appropriate for that middle level. Now, if we look at the check minus level, now we're seeing seldom, rarely, occasionally, inconsistently, and we're using the noun attempt instead of, you know, completion, instead of doing something they attempted. Uh, verbs, verbs like attempt and lack include minimal, inadequate, limited, all of these. Now, here are some criteria with descriptors. So, for example, appropriateness. And a little, little point here, please do not put exactly this in your rubric. That would be plagiarism. That would be uh, not using the rubric correctly, and you could lose points for that. Oh, sorry, not using the handout about rubrics correctly. All right, and the check plus level. So the student consistently uses appropriate request and response forms with most partners. And the middle level, or the, the lowest level, let's do that second, the student attempts appropriate request and or response forms with partners. So here, they're attempting it, but they're maybe not succeeding at it. On uh, the middle level, the student often uses appropriate request and response forms with partners. Another option for the, for the last level could be uh, either attempts appropriate requests and response forms or simply May not, may not even attempt, okay? So either would be appropriate for that level. And I put a star next to response forms. Remember the ultimate uh, purpose of a fluency activity 
is to let students practice a function. So this criterion of appropriateness is trying to measure students' use of these functions. Very important. Um, and again, if your rubric has only accuracy criteria, then it would not be an appropriate rubric for a fluency activity. So for example, you have a role play and your three criteria are pronunciation uh, and vocabulary and uh, grammar. Well, those are not three fluency functions. Those are three, those are not three fluency criteria. Those are three accuracy criteria. So not appropriate for fluency activity. Okay. Uh, well, this concludes our quick tutorial on how to make a rubric. Uh, this is just an additional resource for you. If you would like to see um, more uh, videos about making rubrics, you can ask me to make a second rubric, but I feel like you're going to learn everything you need to learn in class, uh, in the last week of class, in plenty of time to make a simple rubric for the final written lesson plans. Thank you very much, and I will see you in the classroom or online. Okay. Bye-bye, viewers.